Today, people want action that leaders can't or won't deliver. That's our topic. When you look at the United States of America today, you must realize that the world is not judging the United States of America according to what happens on the quiet banks of the Potomac River down in Foggy Bottom at the State Building. The United States of America is being judged by one unknown, isolated black man or black woman who is senselessly beat to death on the streets of the United States. I'm not talking only about black Africa and brown Asia. I'm talking about white Europe. Wherever I've gone, I've had leaders all over the world say, how can you, meaning the United States, expect us to follow you into creating a free world when back in the United States you are clubbing black men and women to death and shooting them down? How can you expect us to do that? Democracy today is a black yardstick. The yardstick by which the world is judging us, and I don't care what you read in the press or hear from the White House or the Department of State, the United States is being judged today by what they're doing to the black man and woman in America. What have they done? This is Lead Stories. I'm Eutrice Lead. It is Wednesday, December the 3rd, and New York City Police Commissioner William Bratton says his department is prepared for the grand jury decision in the police chokehold death of Eric Garner on July the 17th in Staten Island. The grand jury has been meeting for a little bit more than two months. We begin the program today with the words of Adam Clayton Powell speaking at UCLA on January the 10th, 1968. By then he had been stripped of his senior rank in Congress and he had taken the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, but the court decided against him. But what he's talking about, of course, is pertinent to what is happening today and the cases that we have been focusing on for some time. These two particular cases resonating particularly profoundly in the African-American community and in the broader community as well, not just in the United States, but all over the world. People are looking at the United States through the prism of its treatment of people of color. And that has been the case for a long time. Yesterday, we listened to a, a group of, of legislators in Congress expressing their views about the case of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And they spoke with particular passion and conviction and feeling. And I wanted to share that with you because I'm following up on that today. Everything they said was true, I think. Everything they said was well-meaning. Everything they said came from the heart. And yet everything they said was also a palliative. And the unfortunate thing was that it was so symbolic. They're talking at the end of the business day the legislative business day, the House literally was cleared of its members, so nobody even did the 
courtesy of listening to what they had to say. They just were reading and speaking into the record. And that was very symbolic. Because even in Congress, the salient issues of the day, the issues that people have identified as being very important to them, simply just an, are not important to the, the whole body. So there they were, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and they were reciting a litany of reasons why they are concerned. And even as they did that, if you listened carefully to what they were saying, and you know I always encourage while you're listening for what is said, you listen even harder for what is not said. And there was a lot that was not said because apparently they can't say it or they won't say it. And chief among the things that they could not say or would not say is their commitment to parting ways with the standard order. They can't say that. They won't say that. They had very little to say about what it is that they as a body could do to confront the system that they were so clearly identifying as the cause, a root cause of a problem, and yet they couldn't offer any indication at all that they were equipped to take on the fight, they were ready to take on the fight. So precisely at a time that their distressed communities are calling and pleading for that kind of help, we find that they can't deliver or they won't deliver. And it is in this regard that they are an entirely different breed from the Adam Clayton Powells of the world. Powell talked about audacious power. Audacious power, he said, was what was needed in order to respond to and to rectify America's cancer, the cancer, he says, that is eating out the heart of democracy. In everything that was said yesterday, in all the things that they repeated, which we have been talking about ad infinitum, not one of them could stand at the podium and say, I am not with this system. They all are within the party. And they're not, they're not exceptions. This goes all the way up to Barack Obama. Here is the President of the United States in the immediate aftermath of the announcement of this grand jury's non-decision saying to America look, the grand jury has spoken you may or may not like what they had to say but that's the way it is you got to deal with it and we will move on And he's saying this allegedly as a constitutional lawyer. He's saying this and being deliberately uncritical. 
He's saying this knowing full well that there is a problem here. And this is the long-standing problem. It's in your face. And he can't say anything. He won't say anything. So while the people are fired up, he is powered down. And his job and the job of the people he has cultivated for for this particular assignment is to keep a lid on things. Because it is to be understood that for the next two years, he will do nothing to eradicate this thing, this pernicious racial problem that we have in the United States. He's not going to tackle it at all in any form. So while people are asking for justice, he gives them body cameras. While people want to know how come an 18-year-old young man is laying in the street, bleeding from the head, making a kind of macabre median in the road with his blood, He says what America needs, what black America needs, is body cameras. And he's a constitutional lawyer, allegedly. His attorney general is dispatched to Ferguson to put an even tighter lid on things. And... After Ferguson, he goes, this week he is in Atlanta, appearing at the same church where Martin Luther King preached. We understand the symbolism, it didn't escape us. Because, you see, the contempt that they have is that they they mine, they mine all of the emotional strings that we have. And that is one of them. The symbolism, the, 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 the whole idea of the, 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 the government coming to the sacred place in your church, where you ought to at least appreciate some degree of sanctity and truth. And he comes to the people standing at the same pulpit and What is his offering? His offering is, we will now undertake new rules for engagement, especially as it relates to profiling. Well, that's all well and good. But could you talk about the fact that we have a dead young man and we have a grand jury that was essentially manipulated by a prosecutor into an incomprehensible position, an incomprehensible decision here. Can we talk about that? That is not the issue, he says. We have to get some new uh, regulations in place so that they can better police you. They can more efficiently violate the heck out of your rights. The president maintains it's a matter of trust. This is what is wrong. It's it's trust. We have to rebuild trust. They don't talk this way to any other community. They don't. But this is the open contempt that we have, and it is because... Even at that level, the most senior level of leadership, black leadership in the United States, they are on the plantation and they intend to keep everybody else there. 
Barack Obama dare not suggest, he dare not suggest that he has the wherewithal and the power to change things. He, he dare not indicate to America that he's being partial to black people. But it is, of course, not being partial to black people. It's about justice. This is about justice. And for that matter, the history of black people is that their issues have been about justice, not just for themselves, but for everybody. Their struggles have humanized the society. So this is a, a struggle for justice. But they're so terrified. They are so compromised. They are so fully owned by these hidden hands that control them that neither from the president nor from the U.S. Attorney General nor from any of the people that we heard from. I was listening. I'm saying surely somebody is going to say something outside of expected norm. Surely they would do something like that, but no. They are on the Democratic Party plantation. And they would rather offend the people than offend the party. So they give us platitudes. They give us symbolism. They give us right-sounding words. They give us emotion, but they give us no solutions. They have no audacious power. And this is the, this is the tragedy that we confront. This is the tragedy. Because you couldn't find a more compelling reason to side with the people. And what is it that the people want? Do they want this man dead? Do they want Darren Wilson dead? No. What has started this whole thing is they want things to work the way they ought to work. They want a trial. They, that's what's supposed to happen. And even that they can't have and won't have. And the system, all these people who are operating in it, their job, their primary job is to tell them, look, you know, it is what it is. Move on. Get over it. And it is coming from the president on down. And these are people in whom huge investments have been made to put them in office, Barack Obama, twice. With the hope that some kind of change, and it's not, people are not making wild demands here. They're not making extraordinary pie-in-the-sky demands. Something tragic has happened. We need to have a trial. But look at how convoluted it all was. And it's the same thing happening in the Garner case. We talked about this. I told you from the word go. This is how these things are done. They're in your face with it. You do not have the rights of citizens because you are not citizens of this country. You are not real people. How dare you assert rights that are accorded to real people? 
How dare you have expectations that this system should work for you? What is the matter with you? Do you not know the Dred Scott decision? Do you not know that we still uphold it in letter and in spirit? The black man has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. And you have no rights of citizenship because according to that decision, you're not even a person. How dare you? How dare you assume the privileges and the rights of citizenship, which will include a fair trial? That's what people wanted. And that's what the system is determined not to give. And we have to see how this is all playing out. Because the very people who should be championing this cause are the ones who are standing in the well of the House of Representatives and committing to everything except finding a solution and confronting the system. The U.S. Attorney General is similarly minded. He's he's going to come to your church and disrespect your church by lying to you in your face. And the President of the United States is going to tell you that on top of the, the hardship that you experience every single day, on top of the discrimination that you experience every single day, you must now extend yourselves even further and just offer a lot more trust. You are the problem. You're distrustful. So he's going to demand more trust from you And he's going to give the police officers some body cameras so they can accurately record your dispatch from the the, the planet, probably by chokehold or by gun. We have to ask ourselves this question. We have to ask ourselves this question, are we, are we ready to really confront what we are looking at here? Are we really ready to admit that leadership at almost every single level is woefully lacking? But on the other side of that coin, we have to affirm the leadership that is emerging. There is leadership. It is emerging. And the the task is to cultivate that, to lift it up, to support it, and to defend it. Those people who emerge in support of what is right, you lift them up and you support them. We have Alton Maddox. I continue to say he's one of the most brilliant lawyers I have ever seen in a court of law, and I have seen quite a few. Sidelined. And because he's sidelined, we have these predicaments. And we have no outcry, we have no uh, uh, reaching out to say, we, are, we demand this man have his license, and ha- well, he hasn't been deprived of his license, he has a strange kind of existence. 
He has been barred, not disbarred, just barred by a state legislature. It hasn't happened at all ever in the United States. Did he commit a crime? No. Did a client complain? No. And where are all these people who are supposed to say that injustice can't stand? We can't allow that. We're not going to have one of our best defenders of a community sidelined like this, and we are going to make somebody pay. Nothing. These atrocities are committed every day, and we don't have the leadership that has the guts or the principle or even the the intention of doing the right thing, saying, we can't allow this. So one after the other after the other, we heard even the most senior member of Congress, Charles Rangel, a very, very poignant speech, which means these people understand the issue. They know it. They know what's wrong. And not one of them, not one, has said, I do not side with the system. They offer up these palliatives, these band-aids, making nice, saying things that are painfully obvious, but not at all indicating that they have the will or the intention to go to bat for the people. Let's listen some more to some prescient words offered by Adam Clayton Powell in 1968. There is no leadership in this land today. There is none. This is not a great society. This is a sick society. Sick society. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white, Jew or Gentile, Protestant or Catholic, Republican or Democrat, this is a sick society. A society that has a cancer that's eating out the heart of democracy. A society that has dual standards for black and white. A society where the unemployment rate of black people You're listening to Lead Stories on PRN.FM. I'm Eutrice Lead. And we're talking about the fact that precisely at the time that the people are fired up, the leaders are powered down. People want action, but the leaders can't or won't deliver it. They won't deliver on their demands. And why? And what are we going to do about it? This is unacceptable, is what I'm saying. It is unacceptable. And it is it is important to, for us to keep focused here. At every level in these cases, and these two particular cases have come to crystallize the problem. We have the, the, the bloviator-in-chief, Al Sharpton, swooping in. In an industry he has created now, the collector of bones. Have you, uh, anyone in your family who's been shot or strangled, call me. Only if it's if it promises to be a high-profile case that I get to stand in front of the cameras for a long time, I will come in and preach the funeral. That's right. That's, That's my thing. And I get 
through these cases, these awful tragedies, I get to prove my mettle to the Democratic Party or to whoever will pay me the highest, that I am the king of the blacks, and you can trust me. You, I am the go-to guy. I can fix things for you. I could take the heat off, and I could put the heat on. Just give me what I need. And look, I brought in my team, my legal team, my crack legal team, who have yet to respond to these cases in a manner that suggests they understand the issues here. And it's not about collecting a fat settlement. It is not about the money alone. I'm okay with getting money. I'm okay for the people getting properly compensated for their loss. But we are clear that these cases represent an opportunity to address systemic wrongs. And in that regard, you have utterly and completely failed. All of you. You've used this in the case of Sharpton. You've used these kinds of cases to promote yourself. To situate yourself as being an essential factor, a key player. You have commodified your so-called civil rights involvement. Being tutored by Jesse Jackson, you now have an entrepreneurial spirit and your so-called history of civil rights involvement has now got to pay. And you are so grateful that you have been elevated. You are no longer the pariah. You are useful to the political structures that exist. And so you offer your services willingly. You are doing quite well. But you are standing on the bones of people, and the lawyers have to account for the fact that they have fallen down on the job. They're not taking care of business. And so their professional interest, their very personal and professional interest, trumps the overarching issue of justice. And yet they will say, oh, we're we, we here for justice. Well, you show me. Let's take a look, shall we? The president doesn't care. And that's the fact. Barack Obama is more interested in keeping his owners happy. He is not the least bit interested in putting his foot into this hornet's nest. My gosh, he's already accounted for post-Obama America. Racism doesn't exist anymore. He's done a great job of getting rid of it. The U.S. Attorney General, the one who I remind you, was the person who could have done something in the Amadou Diallo case where this man was shot at 41 times. And the police just walked away. They walked away from that execution at his house. He was head of the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice at that time. Nothing came of it. In Ferguson, lots and lots of 
activity, flurry of activity. Oh, we are investigating, we're investigating. Well, look, you have a prosecutor that everybody in the law who knows the law has been saying this is highly irregular the way this grand jury was made to function. And that's a euphemism for this grand jury was manipulated. And what we have here is a case of prosecutorial misconduct. You're the U.S. Attorney General. Signal that you're serious. You want to clean up. You want to clean up Ferguson. You descend on Ferguson and all these people doing all these nasty things. And you descend on them with the full weight of the law because they have had no problem breaking it. They're doing this in your face and you're doing nothing. You're telling people instead that what is needed are new regulations with regard to profiling. These elected officials at the congressional level, at the state level, at the local level. Nobody has yet had the courage to say, you know what, this system is corrupt. Yes, you have a Democratic governor and you have a Democratic prosecutor. In New York, you have a Democratic governor and you have a Democratic prosecutor. But nobody is stepping out of line with the Democratic Party saying, as a party, is this what we want? As a party, are these the kinds of people we want? Or is there some other thing that we need to do? But let me step aside for a minute and talk about this burgeoning leadership and why it ought to be embraced. And why it ought to be defended. It is not perfect. And it's not perfect because you didn't grow it. These people who are emerging as leaders are people who are compelled to action. They didn't go to leadership school. They didn't have the benefit of being groomed. But they certainly have responded appropriately, for the most part, in saying this is a grave injustice and it has been going on for centuries. But certainly in the most, in, in, in modern times, it has been going on for as long as we could remember. And it is time that it stop. And we refuse, we absolutely refuse to be treated this way as a community. We refuse it. We refuse to be dehumanized. And we refuse to have other people dehumanized this way. We are not part of that system. We reject it. So yes, there are new leadership and that's great. Because they're also saying that the people who have been in leadership positions, the people who have ostensibly the capacity to change things are not working. They're not doing the job. Their allegiance is to party. Their allegiance is to the people who are feeding them. The community is incidental to their existence and to even their awareness. When a president of the United States could say to people, after all this history, which tells you, of course, that he either doesn't know history, or he, he's either ignorant of history, or he's just ignorant. That you're going to tell people that what is needed is trust 
and it is now their job to extend themselves even further and against their interests to extend trust. They now have a new job, a new responsibility of citizenship, vote and now cough up some more trust. This is, this is just so horrendously contemptuous. I, I, I can't find the words for it. People need to move away from the system. It is corrupt and it is irretrievable. They need to fashion their own responses, their own political systems and mechanisms to achieve their goals and objectives and to protect their interests. You got to have a plan. You have to have some kind of an alternative because this is not going to work. It's not working. And after a while, when you see the consistency of results and you're still holding out hope that it will change, then you're an idiot. The consistency of results is science. It's a scientific fact. You should accept it as such. And you use that to formulate an entirely different response. There's no reason you have to be married to the Democratic Party or to the Republican Party or to any party that exists. You look with res- to, to these systems with respect to your interests. And our interests are clearly not being served. So the question comes back, what are you going to do? What is the res- what is the response going to be? What is the choice to be made? We have to be very vocal and call these people out. We have to be very vocal about it. We absent ourselves from the system and be very vocal about that. We work with people who are willing to work with us. We form coalitions, and you see that's happening. The younger people are getting the message. They understand that this is not a black problem. This is an American problem. It is a black problem insofar as black people and other people of color have borne the brunt of the disfranchisement, of the segregation, of the poverty, of the wrongdoing, of what our guest not too long ago, Dr. Lance DeHaven Smith calls state crimes against democracy. They're targeted at these communities. Richard Rothstein from the Economic Policy Institute explained to us how Ferguson came to be and how the Fergusons of America came to be. This is by design. This is by design. We've been discussing Detroit by design. Poverty in America by design. Income inequality, they call it, by design. There are no innocent people here in in government. And when this president, and I'm going to point this out until I go hoarse, when this president coming into office with that incredible investment People were just thrilled to say, well, frankly, thank you, thank you, thank you. There is a possibility that a change is here. They so wanted everything to work in that regard. They weren't expecting miracles, but they were expecting some kind of discernible change 
for the better. Not with this president. He checked out a long time ago. I spotted it. And that's why I never voted for him either the first time or the second time. His interests are elsewhere. And so I come back to the question again. Who is going to do this work? What are we prepared to do? What is the alternative? What is the plan? The people are fired up, but our leadership is powered down by design, by intention, by their own will. They refuse to get into the trenches. They refuse to connect with the people and their pain. They are isolated from and insulated against our pain. And so the decision has to be to cut them loose. Put them out of our misery. And make it very, very public. Make it very public and very loud. This is unacceptable by any stretch of the imagination, but particularly given the history of suffering and the history of struggle. People getting killed, lynched, for mere, uh, just mere, the, the idea of just wanting to live. They died for the idea of wanting to live. And we have folks today who are very comfortable with the idea that they have a, a nice office in Congress or a state legislature or the city council. They're making a bit of money that they couldn't have made in, private, in the private sector. And so they're happy and content. And the rest of the world can go to hell. See you when I need you to bring your souls to the polls. We have some work to do, folks. And we better get serious about it because it's about to get even worse. Even worse. But I've shared enough, I've shared enough pain for the day. And so I don't want to begin the next leg of that until, you know, we get a little rest. We could wrap our minds around what was said today. But I really do want you to think about these things. This is where we are as a society. And you would recall that not too long ago, I said we ought to have some serious conversations. We need some serious conversations with ourselves and with each other. Because this thing we called a, a society, this living, breathing organism that we call a society that we are supposedly a part of. It's, it's just exactly what Adam Clayton Powell said. It's sick. It's a sick society. And so much effort is being made to convince us otherwise. But the people are suffering. And this is not some kind of a temper tantrum as some people would have us believe. This is just, oh, they, there they go again. No, this is, this is a foundational thing. This is a, 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 a deeply rooted thing. It is a pernicious presence. And it has accounted for more than enough pain. It is time for it to stop. And the only way it will stop is when people decide to compel it to stop. And in that regard, we have to be prepared. We have to clear some people out of the way. People who occupy offices and are not serving our interests or needs, they've got to go. You've got to build communities, rebuild from the inside out. We have to reclaim our space. 
And we have to understand that our needs are valid. They're not exorbitant. They're not extraordinary. They are quite valid and basic. Basic. So I encourage you to think about these things and to summon up some kind of energy to get involved in transforming not just your community, but transforming the realities within our communities. That's the, that's the, 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 the task ahead. I do want to thank you for joining me today and allowing me to vent a little bit and express these ideas, but they are worth discussing and they are worth contemplating. These things need to be said. You can absolutely reach me on Facebook, Lead Stories with Utrice Lead. I so enjoy hearing from you, and I am very, very grateful for the fact that so many of you are passing the word along, that PRN is your reference point every day, and that Lead Stories is a must, a a one-stop shop. (laughs) Thank you so much for doing that. It's a great, great thing to to be helped by great people like you. Begin the, the, the widening of this conversation and, you know, just broaden the sphere of influence that we should have with each other. So thank you so much for that. And it is also the philosophy that we must take ownership and responsibility for those things those avenues of information that are serving our needs. It's a way of you saying, we recognize that you're doing a good job, and we also recognize that we should be supporting those things that are serving our interests. So thank you so much. A pleasure and a great privilege to be in your company. We'll see you tomorrow.